All right, and we're live, Sal. How you doing this morning, man? I'm doing good. I'm yeah. in uh, Cleveland. It's know, really, it's really gl- uh, green in Cleveland. We came to a big family reunion for Karen, and it's been fun. And while we were here, we met all kinds of people. They were like older that knew about Danny Green and and the mafia in Cleveland. So I got a little bit of education the last couple of days, but we had fun. And now we're ready to talk about some of the New York stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the best way to really go into it is having you take us back to 1977 in New York while you were on the streets and what was going on. I mean, so so take us back. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, It was the summer of 77. And if people were to research what went on, uh, we had several things going on in July of 77. Of course, I was dealing... Uh, heroin secretly but you know that that only took a few minutes a day and i got involved with all kinds of people one of the guys i got involved with was a famous singer called jay black jane american she had hit songs back in the 60s and he i gave him twenty five thousand to record you know a new record but he didn't record the record he went to the racetrack and blew all the money and uh, later on i'll talk about how he almost got me killed i had to have a sit down with some genovese mob guys it was a mess But I got through that, but he invited me to the set of a movie. And the the catch was, he said to me, Sal, I'm going to be one of the few guys who ever kills Sinatra in a movie. Of course, Sinatra got killed in From Here to Eternity, a very famous movie by Ernest Borgnine, who I met like in 2010. But of course, back in 77, I wasn't meeting any celebrities. I didn't have time for that. But I went to the set. It was in Manhattan. And Jay Black had this part of playing like, you know, like a gangster. It was about Sinatra being a a New York City cop who was chasing down the mob. And so while we were there, these were the things happening in the summer of 77. A lot of people don't know how all this came together. But first of all, we had a blackout in July. And that was the same week they were shooting this movie, Contract on Cherry Street. And um, Sinatra was in the movie. Michael Nori in 77 was in the movie. I'd take it ahead to 2009. I gave him a lead part in our movie, Sinatra Club. So all (laughs) these people were on the set and I'm watching, you know, what's going on. I'm kind of new to filming and watching. Boy, I I got, you know, a whole wealth of knowledge. At the end of the night, we would go to a little bar uh, down in Little Italy and have a couple of beers or whatever. I'm sitting there talking and I meet this guy, Sonny Grasso. And Jay Black tells me, you see that? guy over there, Sonny Grasso, he was partners with with uh, Popeye Doyle, the guy who was the lead character in The French Connection. Well, I didn't tell Jay Black anything, but I had just found out through Cataldo that back in the early 60s, he managed to infiltrate the New York City property clerk's office, him and Jackie Donnelly, and they paid a cop, a detective, to show a, show a phony badge, go in and get the French Connection evidence, the heroin out, and they put the bags, put it back in the, in the property clerk's office with flour. And I didn't know it, but in the early 70s, I was actually selling French Connection heroin. <laughs> well, now we're in the late 70s. So we got a blackout in New York. Son of Sam is running around killing people. Okay. And uh, what was interesting, there was riots in New York and in Queens. I believe that Howard Cosell was doing a baseball game. And what he said in the, in the middle of the game was he could look up. He said, look, the Bronx is burning. It was a famous line. They had fires in the Bronx, fires all over New York City. And what really went on was out in Jamaica, sort of a black neighborhood, uh, a bunch of thugs were, you know, looting. And they were stealing turntables. And most people didn't know that was the beginning of the pl- publicity for rap because they were taking these turntables later on the following month in the fall, and they were spinning them, making rap. And that's how they got all the turntables. They didn't have the money to go buy them. So there was all kinds of things happening in in New York City. The son of Sam was killing killing women. I mean, it was just amazing. So I was involved with this Jay Black, the actor, you know, singer. And I met Sonny Grasso. Well, we got through through the 70s. And eventually, when I went to Hollywood, I run into this guy, Sonny Grasso, again. And we start talking. He said, I remember you from that movie. We were drinking beer, you know, at a beer joint in in Manhattan when they shot the movie with Sinatra and all. And we talked. And then 
you know, I had the first book had come out, so that had to be 90. So from 77 to 90, that was already 13 years. And he remembered the book and he read it and goes, yeah, you're in Hollywood, man. You got to keep writing those scripts. He's, that's how you do, you know, that's how you do well here. And he had become a popular producer. But he never knew about my connection with the heroin. Now, get <laughs> back to the heroin. Cataldo and Donnelly, they had this corrupt police officer who used to show a phony badge. He could go in and get anything out of the property clerk's office. So not only did Cataldo get the, you know, that phony cop to get the heroin out and replace it with flour and make a bunch of money, but Donnelly had been investigated for a murder and the cops arrested him and he had a gun on him. And when they seized the gun, they charged him with, you know, a felony. And because he had two other felonies, he was going to go get like 20 years in, in New York State prison. So he goes to prison and Cataldo says, you know what? We can get him out. I go, how are you going to get him out? I'm going to go get the gun out of the property clerk's office. Well, what are you going to do with the gun? He said, I got somebody to make it inoperable. It was working when they busted him. But nobody ever, you know, examined the gun to make sure it was working. So Cataldo pays that same cop with the phony badge to go in, get the gun. They take the gun out. They take it to a, to a gunsmith. He breaks something inside so it doesn't work. They put it back in the public clerk's office. Then they go before the judge, Judge Brennan, the same judge that I had, and they file what they call a newly discovered piece of evidence. And, and Donnelly's in jail. They bring him to court, and they have the gun inspected. And the judge says, well, the gun, you know, was broke. And so it was considered a misdemeanor. He got immediately released. So having the connections with the corrupt cops Cataldo could get away with just about anything in New York City. Of course, he couldn't get away with federal crimes because it wasn't easy, you know, to, to manipulate the federal system. Right. But those were some of the stories. And, you know, I'd like to tell a, a little bit more about Jackie Donnelly, who he was. Yeah. Um, before we do, I was going to say as well, that heroin that got that they were replacing with flour was yeah. the whole reason they got busted was because there was bugs and shit getting on it and they were eating it. I yeah, I, I I didn't know about that, but I think <laughs> some of the packages packages were sealed. Yeah, you and, know, and yeah, and Cataldo had a few pieces of tape, and it said evidence on it. And he showed me, so <laughs> I, I I believe that he was stealing that heroin. Of course, maybe the bugs did get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well, if anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and comment, and we'll get to them after Sal goes into a few more stories. So, Sal, let's hear about Jackie Donnelly. Oh, Jackie Donnelly was an interesting guy. He was about six foot tall. He had wavy blondish hair, piercing blue eyes like Paul Newman. And he had a wife that was a character. She was the slickest of slick. She actually studied what the CIA did with cameras, like miniature cameras. And she had one mounted in a belt buckle. And she'd go into a jewelry store with Jackie and they would be looking at diamonds. And she would take pictures she would take the ring and put it up and look at it, and it would have a little price tag inside the ring. She'd take a picture of that. Then she'd go home and duplicate the price tag. Then they would get a ring, which was like a Tiffany setting, with a two-carat diamond, and they'd put a cubic zirconium in there. They'd go back two weeks later to that jewelry store. She'd put the ring on. She'd do the switch. The switcheroo right in front of you. And she had pictures. I mean, she was slick. She was a master, uh, you know, at credit card theft. Because in those days, they didn't have any online stuff. You gave a credit card and you rolled it over the top and it, with an imprint. And you were able to use it for all kinds of money. So she did all kinds of, you know, paper crime. It's what we used to call paper hangers. She wrote checks from the Bahamas and opened up bank accounts and stole the money before they figured out it was no real check. I mean, she was a slick, she was a slick thief. They should have a movie about her alone. And uh, Jackie loved her. And I mean, they had, were a great couple, man. And she had style. She always gave out exotic gifts to everybody, you know, all our friends around the crew. I mean, she gave out, they gave out $10,000 watches back in the 70s to gifts. So they were sharp. Donnelly and Cataldo were killers. They did take me out one time and say they were going to get a boat. They were going to get a fishing boat. And they were going to use it to cut up bodies and take them out to the ocean while they were going out beyond the international waters beyond and picking up heroin 
shipments. So they had a whole they had a whole plan of what they were doing. Yeah, I mean they had to get a giant boat for that. <laughs> uh, so an- another character I want to talk about too is uh, Donnie Shacks. People don't really know a whole lot about him, but I did yeah. some research on him, and from what I've seen, you know, you, you, we talked about him yesterday on our you know, our show about Peter Sicaro. So we had, right. we're going to drop that next Saturday. So you guys can look forward to hearing that story. But right. we did go into like a little side story about uh, Donnie Shacks. He was, he was, uh, I'll just give a little background of him. He was uh, with Carmine Persico's crew and he was a capo and uh, he dated that model as well. What was her name? Liz. Uh, Elizabeth Hurley. Yep. And uh, he grew up in Brooklyn. He was born in 1938. And him and Carmine Persico came up in the Profaci family and, you know, they would, it would become the Colombo family and they were both on, and, you know, they both did serve on the Gallo side and then they went to the Profaci family during that internal war. But I mean, he he would just go on to do a whole lot of stuff. So, and uh, I mean, he'd recently died too. And when he was 82 years old of COVID. So there's a lot. I think maybe we could do a whole episode on him. But I mean, if you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Donnie Shags, let's, let's hear it. Well, I only met him once. Cataldo brought me to a meeting and, you know, he said, uh, we got a piece of work, uh, you know, sort of an assignment for you to do for us as a favor. You got to go out. And this is a guy out there in Long Island who has a huge house. And, you know, he's been paying us big interest on loans, but he all of a sudden he stopped paying and he owed like a couple hundred thousand. They didn't want to kill him because they wouldn't get the money. The first they want to do is rob his house. So I took Peter Sakao. We went out there and, you know, I didn't really want to do any more robberies because Foxy was dead. I was done with that stuff. I was strictly dealing drugs. And Cataldo asked me, look, can you pull this thing off? It's a favor. And I met Donnie Shacks, Shacks, Shacks. I think they call him Shacks because he shacked up with a lot of girls or something, you know. <laughs> but he yeah. later on went to Hollywood and got involved with, with Hollywood people and athletes and stuff. Yeah, you know. So he was, uh, I think he would invite Larry King to Monday night football games and stuff. Yeah, he was inviting a lot of celebrities and the feds yeah. were just trying to bust him for anything. Yeah. And yeah. In it, this is what he went, went to prison for. He uh, got four years ultimately because he had like a altercation with his wife. He was watching her two younger kids while she went out and did something. And she came back late and he was all pissed off and I think he assaulted her. And then the cops got involved. And then they dropped the charges or she dropped, wanted to drop the charges, but they didn't let him. So they pursued him. He got four years for it all. Wow. And yeah. So, I mean, he, like I said, he died of COVID recently, but you know, when they were really trying to get him, they, they weren't giving up. They weren't going to let anything, you know, slip away, especially that. In the nineties, they had a radar on him in LA. Because the FBI, I think I told you, an FBI agent that I knew from New York yeah. had been transferred to L.A. And he asked me if I knew anything about him in L.A. I go, no, I hadn't seen that guy in years and years. But they were watching him in L.A. because I, he was involved with some some football players. I think they were kind of getting corrupt and stuff, you know. But he, they told me, the feds told me all about what he was doing. At the same time, I think I spoke before a whole group of FBI agents about a guy like me flipping and how they could... They were working on flipping guys in L.A. Of course, you never hear much how they do it. But I spoke at an FBI conference, and they were raising money for an FBI agent in New York who had been arrested on a charge uh, to do with, I think, uh, Greg Scarpa. Lynn DelVecchio, right? Yeah, Lynn DelVecchio. I think he beat the case. But I helped him raise some money. I didn't give any money, but I spoke. (laughs) And they made donations. Yeah. No, oh, I mean, that, that is interesting that you did. So that, that we'll have to do a whole thing on that, I think, too. So Donnie Shacks and then this Linda Vecchio, you know, all this whole relationship with him. And then another guy we might have to cover, too, is Vincent Papa Sr. Right. So Vincent Papa, who I met sometime in the mid-70s, he used to hang out in a, in a nightclub Cataldo and I would frequent. And I met him one day, you know, maybe – just casually having a drink. Later on, Cataldo had told me all about him. I believe he went to prison and got murdered in prison, from what I read. Yeah, let me look. I think so. Yeah, he was killed. The reason he was killed was because he reached out to prosecutors offering his assistance. Yeah, and And he was involved. Yeah, he was involved in that French connection. 
case. Yeah. I, think. I think they found a million dollars on him and somebody else once. He was, yeah, they did. And then he was also busted with three, <clears throat> 398 pounds of the French connection drugs well, and 120 go. pounds of cocaine. Yeah. Well, there you yeah. go. So some of that must have been destined for Cataldo. And then Cataldo passed it on to me. You know, yeah. didn't yeah. know where you didn't ask where it came from. You just, you know, you just sold it. You got rid of it and got the money. You turned it into money. That was it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll have to do one because he was an associate of the Lucchese crime family. And, right. you know, he was busted for drugs at a young age. Never was a main member, but he was, uh, you know, close with Carmine Tremonti. Yeah. And, you know, the we'll have to do a whole thing because there's a lot of information on this guy. Right. Right. And he's very interesting as well. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> again, if anybody wants to comment in any questions, me and Sal are going to go into one more a little side thing about Peter Sicaro that we did an uh, episode about yesterday. We recorded it. It'll be coming out this Saturday. But, you know, Sal had a pretty close relationship with Peter and they, uh, you know, he was a younger guy. Right, Sal? I mean, yeah, I, I met him guess. when he. I met him when he was like 21 and he wanted to be a gangster. That's what he wanted to be. When I met him, he was a car thief. And I believe somehow he got introduced to Charles Coniglia and eventually worked his way over the next few years in and around the Gotti's. And uh, he actually begged me to teach him how to rob an armored car. And I gave him all kinds of information. Uh, the kid that he hung out was a guy named Andrew Curro, who turned out the guy killed his girlfriend. So, I mean, I read about that years later. But by the time they were in the middle of their, you know, crime life, I had already left New York City and moved upstate New York around 1981 or 82. They were hijacking trucks. They were hijacking. They actually robbed two armed cars, the same company. Yeah, that is, you know, he's, he asked you, he said, uh, what is one thing you never did? Right. And that's what he said. You know, and then you told him about the armoring truck and that's what yeah. he wanted to do, but. You Guys know. always wanted to up when they saw somebody who was successful, you know, as a successful hijacker or a bank robber or a jewel thief. They wanted to do something like you did, but better and bigger. And that gave him the opportunity to go brag to Angelo. And he got close because he was in the same neighborhood, Howard Beach, as Angelo Ruggiero and John Gotti, eventually making his way from one family to another. And they took him on. You know, they took on Peter Zakara thinking, oh, this guy's a tough guy. I never talk much about the people he killed, but he did kill people. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, too, at the end of our video that we did on him, I asked you, I said, you know, because he's one of the, really the only one that's maybe, I think that that out of the 10 hitmen we did, he's only the one or two that are still alive. So I asked you, I said, what would you say to him if, yeah. he, were, if he were to watch this? And you answered that so people can look forward to yeah, they you know, what listen. you told him. Yeah. yeah, they should listen to that. <laughs> yeah, Because I, I liked him. He was like, you know, like a little brother to me because I was 10 or 12 years older than he was. And he was just learning about crime. I mean, you know, organized crime. In fact, he was a terrific car thief. I said that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you had a lot of little car thieves around you when you were, yeah. <laughs> when you were doing your business. But Yeah, those guys were great. Well, uh, let, let's see what we got in here. So we'll go to the first one. Gray says, hey, how you doing, man? How are um, you? Michael says, love your story, Sal. Yeah, we like to, you know, get them out there, the stories. I don't want to brag on them, but I always had this energy, so I might as well tell it with enthusiasm <laughs> and, you know, a little bit of candor and some <clears throat> comedic, a little comedic touch. Some of these stories are funny because mob guys, they're not exactly 100-watt bulbs. These guys, I mean, you know, <laughs> they're not the sharpest tool in the shed, but they're funny and they're ballsy. So, yeah, they're good stories. Yeah, they are. Well, thank you for that, Michael. My father, remember, you, we, we didn't even go on. We'll talk about this a little bit. Yeah. He, he said, good morning, gentlemen. Me and Sal actually had the pleasure of meeting each other. Yeah. What, uh, what was it, Wednesday or Tuesday? I can't Last, even remember. Yeah. Last week, you had a steak with your dad. Yeah, that was, that was good, fun. man. Uh, really good. Dad. I'll have to put that picture up and see if I can do it here in a minute. Let my wife, just... my wife Karen, she liked, uh, she liked your dad and your relationship because oh. you showed how how close your family was. Oh yeah, well we appreciate you guys coming and seeing us, man. It was yeah. it was our pleasure, man. We it's been a long time coming. Right. right. <laughs> um, let's see. So Ubats, <laughs> will... I like I like to pay. I hate to tell you this, but I know that that coach. Uh, for the Patriots is really an amazing coach. So 
he'll find a way to stay close to the Jets. So if the Jets make any errors, I kind of think the Patriots will beat the Jets. Uh, you'll see what happens with the quarterback, you know, because he's sort of still new, the Jets, Jets quarterback. And, you know, thanks for asking that, Michael, because Sal was talking about maybe doing a possible, uh, what, like a like a show on, you know, football, right? What, football, what would you have yeah. in mind? Like football and the mob, you know. like Yeah, that. football and the mob. Yeah, I think that'd be a good one. Yeah. Let's see. Tony V said, whatever happened to Donnelly and his wife? You know, I, I have no idea. I wish somebody would listen and tell me, you know, what happened to Jack Donnelly. I think his name was John Joseph. Donnelly, but he was a ballsy guy. He was a tough guy. He was Cataldo's closest buddy. And I mean, they killed people, hijacked, robbed. They actually told me once they robbed the bank in 90 seconds. So they were slick. They were really slick, ballsy. And he was really committed to Cataldo as in the old fashioned mob days where they could have twisted his arm and his leg. He would have never said a word, you know, and flipped to the other side. But I don't know what happened. I wish I could find out. What happened to John Joseph Donnelly and his wife Joanne? Her name was. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be interesting because there's not really, like I said, I could hardly. There was some information, but I just could not find a picture. Like you right. said, there, he, he was didn't really get much in trouble at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, he had a follow up. He said Larry King was a degenerate gambler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He hung out with uh, with Donnie. Donnie Shay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, I did a whole Friday night with Larry King. I think you might even find it. It's still on online, you know. And I had fun with Larry. One time I mistakenly called him Gary. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll be Gary tonight because this was in the early aid, early stages of Gotti being the boss. And, you know, I mean, Larry King was from New York. He knew what the mob was all about. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he was a pretty good gambler, but I had fun. I did a whole Friday night with him. Damn, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Let's see. John said, hey, morning, guys. So <clears throat> when Johnny G was assaulted in prison, you think he immediately put a hit on the other inmate? I don't know. I heard some stuff through the FBI that he got I don't know, the brothers, the Aryan brothers or something to try to to kill the guy who assaulted him. But John was a ballsy guy and he was prejudiced. He was a prejudiced guy. So he probably used the wrong language. And he was already old or, you know, in the 60s. You you can't compete physically with a guy in their 20s or 30s. You know, you're no. sort of an old, you're an old man at 60, you know. Yeah. No, yeah. That, that, no, thanks for that question, John. Let's see. We got another one from Angus McDonald. He said, hey, guys, hope you're well. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, bots, I need a good pick for today. <laughs> a pick for today. Well, you know, I'm in Cleveland. And my wife is a Browns fan. And the other night, Monday night, they blew blew a game. And my wife would always say, gee whiz, Cleveland finds the way to lose. I like Cleveland because they got a good defense. I would say, I don't know how, what the line is. They're playing the Titans. But I also like the Titans because I, got, I like that moose they got in the backfield. So I don't know. I mean, I just like, I like to see Cleveland win so they could turn it around. But you got to pick one yourself, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we got one from Slabin, I believe. Slabin Charlie. He said, uh, Sal is the real deal. I love this. Well, I'm glad you appreciate the stories. I, I try to convey them as accurate as I can, Charlie. Uh, you know, I still have a really good memory from 50 years ago. And I did an <laughs> interview for Netflix. That's going to pop up soon. And then I just got contacted from another company in the uk we're going to do another interview next month so we'll let you guys know what these in, where these interviews take place what they're going to be about most of them are about you know mob guys organized crime and uh, you know i go in and i meet with them and give them all kinds of you know great information firsthand that's what i like doing i like to say i like to use the line i was there so that that's people true. know know that you were really there it's not i'm not a researcher picking up something on YouTube or, you know, on Google or something, but <laughs> the real most, deal. most of it's all pretty accurate. And Adrian does a good job finding information out also. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the, that, that Charlie, we appreciate it. Um, speaking of the UK, we have someone say it from his name's fat Dave. He said, great shows watching from uh, Birmingham, England, United Kingdom. <laughs> That's well, dope. Oh cool. yeah. Thanks. That's really Dave. cool. 
all the way like, out there, man. Yeah, I see you must be 1982. That means you're like 41 years old. So this stuff is very historical for you. And I know the UK loves mafia stuff. So one of these days, maybe I'll get there. Um, that would be really cool. If you got a question, Fat Dave, send it in. We'll we'll yeah. see what we can answer. Um, Pete said, any more stories about Vinny Papa? You know, I didn't really know him that much because when I you know, hung out with Cataldo in the 70s, he was very careful about what information he let me hear. And of course, that was the early 70s. When I went to jail and came back out after I did a little bit of time, they trusted me more because, you know, they're always worried about, well, how's the guy going to handle jail and all that? But I didn't really know a lot about him, about Vinnie Papa. I just knew that he was the connection that Gotti, um, not Gotti, I'm sorry, that uh, Dominic got the, the drugs from. Yeah. Um, well, I can maybe find something here, too. Uh, so from one other thing that I researched about Vinny was that he was reported to be a very huge heroin de dealer. And it was reported by the feds that he was selling 25 kilos a week for many years. <laughs> wow. A lot. And if people don't know what the price of pure heroin was in those days, I remember because Cataldo would sell it for like 225000 per kilo. Well, there's a thousand grams in a kilo, like 33 to 34 ounces. And I had to pay about 4,000 an ounce. So when I got an ounce of pure heroin, I can make seven ounces out of it. Damn. So that would bring me back about 20 some thousand dollars. Invest 4,000, get 24,000 back. And if I can get rid of one or two a week, I was making money. Yeah, and for this guy to be selling 25 of them, that's insane. Oof. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah, and another one is, uh, you know, about Vinny was in 1972, the feds had saw him and a drug partner walk into a house with a briefcase that wasn't heavy at all. And then when he came out, the guy, the guy was holding two hands on the briefcase and trying to barely carry it. So the cops wow. pulled him, pulled up behind him and they checked to see what was in it. And they found a whole bunch of cash. They arrested them and they let him go. But, you know, they, they did have one million dollars in cash that the cops kept wow. for evidence <laughs> and that was a lot of money in the 70s yeah that is and they were just trying to carry it <laughs> you know he was trying to struggling with two hands you know so i mean they were watching and stuff but who knows i mean well like i said i i did a lot of research on these guys i think that's why it'd be interesting to do a whole whole deal on them but <laughs> oh, yeah. thanks for that question pete let's see john said thanks for answering his question earlier no uh, let's see this one, <laughs> do you bet, Sal? Tony V said. No, I learned a long time ago, you can't win. I mean, I've marked down some picks like for yesterday. I'm telling you, man, I'm lucky if I get one winner out of three. You can't, like, for example, last night, the line on the Ohio State, because I'm in Ohio, and um, Notre Dame game was three. At the end of the game, the score was by three. I mean, you know, I laugh. How do these bookie guys figure out a line. It's so close, you know, and it all changed within the last minute. So nah, I wouldn't recommend betting. I mean, if you put a money, put a bunch of money in a shoebox and bet it and take out what you pay and see how much you can put in by the end of the year, shoebox will be empty. <laughs> That's true, man. I mean, I, I just did an interview uh, yesterday with uh, Larry R Rolla. He was uh, a horse ra horse racer, so he would fix races, and he was connected with the, a lot of different mom guys. And right. he got into debt with the mom, a or one million dollars because of just being a bad gambler. And, uh, and you know, he would always pay the weekly vig, yeah. So they would keep giving him more and more. They didn't wow. have no problem just keep. I was like, they didn't stop you. They didn't tap you out. <laughs> that, like, that reminds me when you brought this up. After we get off, remind me to tell you about a millionaire that I had met that had horses in Florida. And oh. he, it was a whole scam with Billy Joel. Billy and Joel. So, I got a whole story. I forgot about it until you just mentioned it. Damn. And how they electrocuted horses in Florida. Really? They were insurance. Jeez, that's yeah, horrible. So I, I just remembered that. So Yeah, <laughs> that would be an interesting one. Because this this Larry as well, he he had uh, got did some stuff with John Gotti too. He he got uh, I think that he gave him some horses or something. They they did some kind of stuff, but the mob and the, you know, they were definitely into the whole sports betting or yeah. race yeah. racing. You know, uh, let's see. Michael said thanks for answering this question. Yeah. David 
said, greeting from Oakland, California. Love your story, Sal. What a gentleman. I, I kind of liked Oakland. I spoke over there at Dewey High School in Oakland once to the kids that were ready to go to jail. It was like a halfway spot, you know, kids that were arrested for crimes, girls, guys. And I spoke there two or three times in, in, uh, in Oakland. That's a tough place, boy. That's mm -hmm. like Brooklyn in, in ways, Oakland. No, no, I'm sure. And then you said you were in there in the 90s? Uh, no, I that, spoke there around, yeah, around the 90s or 2000. I think. Yeah, it was really, really violent. And those, those, yeah. those, that era of, you know, gangs and stuff. I mean, it still really is. But I think back then it was just really, you know, more going on back then. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Michael Amari says, Saying hello from Derry in H. Where, where is that? Where's that initial for? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. So I thought, okay. Michael's looking. Michael's looking for a winner today. <laughs> yeah. Best winner is put the money in your pocket. Yeah, <laughs> just keeping it. <laughs> looking at it at the end of the game. So, oh, like they saved money. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I, we got this question uh, from TA. He said, "Sal, did you know Vinny Asaro? And did he? What was he part of the Lufthansa heist?" I, I did know him, and I knew his cousin, Gary, or they called him Gaspa Valente. And Gaspa had a son that was on my team. He was a little chubby guard. He played uh, the line. I did know them, and I had just gotten away from those guys around, uh, you know, 81, like that. Uh, after the Lufthansa thing went public, I think Jimmy Burke hung out with them. But I didn't know their dealings. I mean, I... I knew that it was going to explode that whole mess. And uh, I think he's around 88, 90 years old now. Damn. He beat the Lufthansa case. He did. He couldn't Damn. prove it. Yeah. Was he with the Lucchese's or Bonanno's? What was he with? Um, I think he was the Bonanno guy. Yeah, and that's, that sounds familiar. Vinny Asaro, yeah. I think so, too, from the Bonanno. Yeah. Let's see. Dutchman had a question. He said, Sal, did you know Peter's partner, Frankie, who clipped – in the Cafe Liberty? Oh, I didn't really know, Frank. I'm not sure. I knew a guy that Peter knew, a guy named Frankie, Frankie, Frankie uh, Lapp, and he was good with stolen cars. But I didn't know who got clipped in the Cafe Liberty. That's interesting that he mentioned that Cafe Liberty because that was the Ruggiano mm -hmm. you know, sort of operation. They would buy and sell gold and jewelry and with another guy named Tony Lee. And I believe Anthony Reggiano told the whole story about who they killed in that cafe. But I had never even gone in there, yet it was only 10, 15 blocks from where I lived. Mm. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, that's it wasn't too far. I mean, same area, same time. So it, it definitely could be the Frankie that you might be talking about. But, you know, like you said, these guys were younger, like 10 years yeah. younger than you. So yeah. you weren't really hanging out with them and stuff no. like that. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, I didn't know those guys at that point. Let's see. <clears throat> Thank you for that question, though, Dutchman. Another one we got from Florida Attorney. <clears throat> hey, Sal, is it true you dated uh, Marissa Tomley <laughs> in 19... Marissa Torme. Torme. That's the girl from Cousin B. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. That's what they get. Dude, this guy asked that before, I think. <laughs> she's, she's a funny, funny gal. Great actress. No, I didn't know her and I didn't date her. I didn't know anything about that fish box. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, someone asked about that before. That's I think funny. This is the that's same funny. one. <laughs> yeah. I liked her as an actress, though. Yeah, I never met her, and then you know she's she was with Pesci in that movie. Oh, okay. She won an Academy Award. It was a good movie. Yeah, Cousin Vinny. Cousin Vinny. Yeah, I still have yet to watch that one. John said she's gorgeous. Now she's a sick, sick left. leftist. <laughs> what is it? Oh, a leftist political like oh, the political yeah. chick. I, I don't know much about her. Either. Yeah, no, uh, let's see. Tony V said uh, Europe has gone downhill with the drug trade and organized crime in the last few decades. You know, I always saw that coming. Uh, I mean, I just didn't want to admit it to myself that drugs was going to be the demise of the mob, but I did see it coming. I saw the young guys in the 70s that I was in federal prison with, we weren't even 30 years old. You could see the power of the money and how it corrupted the young guys and the older guys because the older guys couldn't make the money that the young guys were making. They didn't, they listened to the bosses and a lot of them didn't deal drugs. So they were, they were like in poverty, but uh, I could see it all coming, you know, cause that's what money does. It can corrupt people easily. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good question there, Tony V. He also had a follow-up and said, these bookies are smart. Definitely stay away from gambling. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, John said, go Bucks, baby. I, I'm actually from Ohio, 30 miles from south of uh, – how do you say that? Toledo. Toledo, Toledo okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Tony said he's looking forward to that Billy Jewel story. Oh, I yeah. Be a good one. I completely forgot about it until somebody brought up, you know, something about horses. And oh, I did, about, about the Larry Rock Roller. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting yeah. story how he got sucked in, Billy Joel, by his brother-in-law. And, and I'll talk about some secret stuff that I did for a millionaire. I actually was wiretapping his phones in Manhattan in a penthouse listening so and that was in the in the early 80s after i left new york i was still involved with all kinds of things but i will talk about that story okay my father he said uh it was a really uh pleasure meeting you and having supper with your wife and my son adrian oh yeah it was pretty fun i enjoyed it and so did my wife karen we had fun with you guys i'm gonna see if i can play our picture let me let me look Uh, video file let me try. Let's see what this does. Window, tire screen. Yeah. I think I can actually get it. Well, that's cool. I think yeah, because we we haven't done this before. We haven't shared like a, like a you know like something on screen as we're talking. Right. So yeah. This is all new to me, but. Yeah, let me just share my screen. Oh, there you go. Can you see it? Uh, oh, there, oh, there we are. <laughs> yeah, you can see it somewhat, yeah. In front of your dad's Chevy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's 1952 Chevy. Let me let wow. me pull the one up with him, you and him. Yeah. There you go. There it is. Very good, <laughs> cool. very good. Yeah, let's see. You guys, you guys can see our encounter that we did. That's dope. Yeah. Let's see and this hit remove on there. Boom. Okay. That's off there now. But yeah, that, no, that's a good one. That was a good time when we went out there and met. Uh, let's see. Another question says, Sal, did you know Mikey Boy Par- Par- say that? Mickey Boy Paradiso. Yeah. Uh, Paradiso. I think they were involved por- in pornography. I didn't know those guys. But they were connected, and I think... Maybe Jimmy Burke was involved with it. I'm not sure about that, though. There was rumor. A lot of times guys were involved with crimes that other mob guys wouldn't participate in, like, you know, sort of like prostitution or like pornography. But I didn't pay attention to that stuff. I didn't know the Paradiso Paradiso group. I didn't know those guys. Didn't really care to get involved in the porno business. No. 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 (laughs) You didn't want to be an actor. (laughs) Let's see. Uh, it could have been Anthony's brother-in-law that got clipped. That's who right. he had right. that follow-up about the yeah the guy. In the yeah, leopard. he told that story because I mean I knew his whole family. I knew Albert, his brother, Anthony, Francine, his sister, Jenny, his mom. I mean Jenny, the mother would come in my deli. I had a deli around the corner <laughs> from where they lived, and she'd get some cold cuts. You know, she's a nice, quiet woman. And uh, you didn't see Fat Andy that much in the neighborhood. He was always somewhere else. Eventually, he went to jail. I don't know. I, I really didn't say have anything to say derogatory or negative about Albert's father, uh, Anthony's father. But, you know, we had a little encounter, and that was it. I don't know. I don't think he liked me in the 60s when, when Anthony was a little kid. I, was, I had a bookie operation in the, in the mid-60s with Catalbo. Yeah, well, that's a good way to answer that. I think, uh, let's see, you know, we don't, let's see. I was going to get off that. Uh, I was going to see if you knew this picture, because when I sent it to you, you're like, where did you find this? This is you, right? Yeah, that was uh, when I did a Geraldo show in 1989. I was a young-looking 44-year-old guy, and it was uh, a magazine that was based in London. And I did an interview interview for the for those people, and yeah, I was uh, between my first marriage and the rest of my life in 1989, <laughs> just learning about Hollywood, you know, all that kind of stuff. Damn, yeah. I, I, I when I was looking for more pictures of you on there, I, that's the one I came across, and I was like, uh, "Holy shit, does that sound?" <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. 
Yeah. Let's see. If anybody has more questions, please ask them. You know, we're just going through answering them. Uh, where else were we? Michael said, you're right. I'll keep my money in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. What, how do you say his name? Frankie DeChico. No, no, no. The guy's name. I, Sal, you know, did you ever meet Frankie DeChico? Oh, oh, Computron. Computron? Okay. Yeah, that's what it looks I, like. I was actually in jail with Frankie DeChico in the 70s before he was popular. And then when he got out, he became close to Gotti. Poor guy went was going to a meeting and they blew him up in a car. And the truth was the Italians had promised each other in the families not to use bombs to kill people. But I think Casso, Casso was sick and he wanted to kill Gotti so bad. He thought Gotti was going to be with DeChico. And from what I read, he was blown up in the car. He was a nice guy, Frankie DeChico. I knew him in prison. Damn, you know what? We'll have to do an episode on him because he was a prominent figure, and a lot of people always have questions about him, or you know, the, you know, any any information about him. And for you to have some firsthand yeah. stories with him, I think yeah. that'll be that'll be good. And that was a good question there because, yeah, he was, I believe, John Gotti's underboss for a little bit. Oh yeah, know, he was. He beginning. was close. We were in jail together. Of course, Angelo Ruggiero was in the penitentiary. De Chico was there. Jerry Langella was there. Alley Boy Persico, they were all in Lewisburg. Uh, Joe Piney was there. Paulie Vario cutting the garlic. And and if, and also um, Johnny Dio, a vicious old timer, was there. And that room, I'm really considering doing a, uh, doing a stage play about Mafia Row at Lewisburg Penitentiary because there was no phones there. And Henry's position in prison was to steal the meat. He worked in the butcher shop. So Henry was always stealing something. <laughs> Henry, and yeah. no, uh, you Henry, know, yeah. uh, Joey Bubbles is actually, you know, in the chat right now. To oh, there he is. Joey, if you want to come on and talk about this project that Sal's trying to get going yeah. on, on this prison project. We need, some, we need some investors. Yeah, yeah. not much. We're going to do a play in Vegas. Let them know what it is, Joey. Yeah, Joey, I'll uh, send you that link and you can. So, I mean, just to give a background to the people, I mean, so, we're, you know, Sal's trying to get, um, you know, you explain it, Sal, you know what it is. Well, you know, I was there in that room. People look at the Goodfellas movie and they see that Paul Ivario cutting the garlic. But there was a lot going on then. And, uh, you know, as Johnny Dio, big time captain and Vario, they had a hook. They had these guards under control. They were scared to death, the guards. So they would smuggle stuff in like food. It was interesting. They would smuggle food in, pepperoni, salami, boo, some booze, some cigars. And uh, the room itself, it was the, it was the center of all the Italian guys there. And if I tell you all the guys that were in and out, it's just amazing. That was 74. How many of those guys got close to Gotti 10 years later? And so I always thought it would be great historical take on Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary inside this room, which was called Mafia Row. Now, Bubbles could tell you more. He knows. Yeah, yeah and, and he, I mean, like you said, I mean, that, that sounds like it, it might potentially happen. And, you know, even if we got to start like some kind of GoFundMe, you know, to get this project seen, yeah. I think it'd be cool and just to see what we can do. Because you had some actors in mind too, didn't you? Oh, yeah. A lot, most of these guys were already over 50. They were in the 60s. So it'd be easy to get some of the guys from Sopranos, good fellows who were older guys and maybe one or two young actors because I really think it was a piece of history. And, you know, I once listened to someone tell me that Henry Hill's book, Wise Guy, was actually required reading back in the in the early 80s because of how much information was disseminated about the American Mafia through Henry's book. And I feel <laughs> the same about, you know, Mafia Row, which was in Lewisburg, and how the mob ran that prison. I yeah. mean, I don't think the, the, the head warden was involved, but the assistant warden and some of the hacks, they wanted to keep everything quiet. So they used the Italian mob to keep everything sort of, you know, even like in that prison. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, it looks like Joey Bubbles is in. So I'm going to bring him in. 
Hey, what up, is, Joey? How you doing, man? Hey, there's Bubbles. Oh, he's like in the Panthers today. <laughs> no, this is the Mississippi Lady Panthers. This is the girls' football team down here in Mississippi that I work. Oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how you doing? Professional- there's a women's professional football league out there called the WNFC, Women's National Football Conference. And, and you're, uh, are you coaching? I coach it for three years. Now I just took over the front office. I'm doing. Uh, I'm the GM, and I do like director director of business operations. But yeah, I How coach. About that, he's yeah, doing so- some. He's doing some football business. I, I thought it was monkey business. Hey, when I first went out there, I said it's girls. I'm like, so like, do they wear lingerie or is it like powder puff? They like, no, you got to come out and see. And I walked out, and these girls are like, did twice the size of me. I had a linebacker that used to pick me up every time. She's like, Coach Joe, and she pushed me around. Right yeah, definitely. Uh, what, what I wasn't expecting to see what I, I got. He's in, Miss- you. He's in Mississippi. I'm in Mississippi. Yeah, damn. Okay. Right? He was in the program, but I live in Mississippi. Come on. <laughs> you, remember, you remember in uh, in Cousin Vinny when they arrested the two two kids, you know, yeah. and, and and one guy said to the other guy, you kidding me? We're an hour fucking rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Bubbles, they say. Someone commented right now. <laughs> That's Mrs. Bubbles. That's, That's my Mrs. Wife. <laughs> oh, is it actually? <laughs> it's really my wife, yeah. <laughs> Oh shit! Well, Sal, what you, what do you want him to expand on? On this well, you know, it's funny. We lived together almost a year in Vegas, back in '15, and Joe, Bubbles, and my son, who I call Joe Bags, because he liked bags of donuts. <laughs> they they produced my one man play on stage. Yeah, and uh, they would introduce the Joey Bubbles would introduce me, and I would sort of do a biographical take of where I came from. And then we lived together, and I used to tell him, sit here. I'm going to teach you how to watch movies. Yeah. And so every week we watch a couple of really good movies, like A Few Good Men. I go, look at the camera. Make believe you're the camera. Look. And you go, oh, my God. Now I see what you said. Yeah. Now, he's, now he's a producer in movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, damn. So, I mean, you, you put him on some early game back then. Put yeah, him on some yeah, literally did. It made me look at things completely different. And even the show that we did in Vegas was so much fun because, you know, the two of us with our relationship, he would be on stage telling stories. And I was kind of like, after we would introduce him, I would walk around to every table and sit down and talk to people, but he would tell a story. And then I would sit with like a family that was having dinner and I would start telling them the same story. Like I said, see that story he's telling. I was 14 when that happened. Then I would tell him from my, and it was just fun to play off each other from his stories and stuff. And we had a great time. It's just, you know, Vegas is crazy. There's so many things to do in Vegas. It's hard to get people to come to one thing, you know, it's like, yeah, I could see that. But I mean, with this one in particular, what do you think about Sal's idea with this? I love this. I love it. I think it's great. Especially, you know, Goodfellas was such a huge movie. And if you ask people about Goodfellas, you know, everybody that I know that makes, uh, you know, pasta sauce, they talk about cutting garlic with the razor blade or the guy making the steak. So that scene, so that not only was that movie so popular, but that scene in the jail is like the one that everybody always talks about, you know? Historical. Yeah, I I can hear... I could see uh, the uh, the table, the big round table, a bunch of guys sitting around, and I could hear Bubbles' voice with the audience <laughs> telling what this was going to be all about, and then mm-hmm. I was there. So I mean, it is a piece of history, yeah, and, and never to be done again, you know. Well, and that was funny, you know, when that came out, you know, Sal was like, "Joe, I was like in that cell, like I was there." With the, you know, I mean that. So he, the scene that everybody loves, he actually lived it. And then we started talking about, you know, what could we do next? You know, we're getting a lot of people enjoying this stuff on here. You guys are doing a great job. And then we was like, what if we just do something like from that cell, you know? And it's like, I love it. Absolutely. Love it. There's so many stories with him. You know, it's, it's just, which one do you want to go with? You know, and you want to run with and then doing it as a one man show. I saw, you know, we would do a show that lasted an hour and a half and then we'd have a Q and a that lasted longer. Like we, <laughs> I mean, we had to go, all right, we got to stop now. We're yeah. done. Oh. I also be doing all day. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was interesting things that happened in the summer of 74 in that prison. I got to tell you, one of the most interesting things was, I mean, you got a bunch of mob guys, nobody pays taxes. They believe everybody's corrupt. And we all get into the TV room waiting for Tricky Dick to uh, to address the nation. And he had already said the week before, "I am not a crook." We all know he we all knew he was a crook. And then he resigned. And we would run around the prison and go, "Hey, how you doing?" I am not a crook. It's like Spartacus. I am not a crook. I am not a crook. And we would laugh our butts off. You know, I mean, 
We knew he was corrupt. I mean, he was bringing money in for B.B. Rabozo. I mean, yeah. look, he was doing all kinds of corrupt things and got away with it then because, you know, poor Trump today, they got more damn wiretaps, pictures, and everything back in oh, Nixon's yeah. day. Nixon's day, he had nothing. No, hell no. It's a completely different ball game. Yeah. But I, I think this this idea would be really cool to do, like, like Sal said in Vegas, you know, have – you know, like a little, it would be like, what would it be really? Would it be like a, a live thing? Yeah, live. It's live, live show play. And, and Bubbles would be the moderator. <laughs> <I'm back. laughs> yeah, no shit. Partnering up to do something. Did, did you good. help him with that mob dinner thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, it was us. It was me, him, and, and his son, Joe. That was three oh, of them. Okay. We had fun. We had a lot Here, of I'm going to grab the card. You guys keep talking. I'll, I'll bring right. it to show the people. Okay. It was the fall. It was the fall of, uh, the fall of 15. We had a lot of fun there. We yeah. did. We had a great venue. We had a great guy helping us with the venue. And, uh, of course, it was on the rooftop of a strip joint, which was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had to go through two floors of a strip club to get to one club on the top floor. But, no, the guy the guy loved the idea. He gave us the venue. All he wanted was the bar. He said, you yeah. guys take the venue for free, and you could – the door but i just want the bar that's what he wanted and it was on the rooftop of a famous strip club in vegas they had three stories and the top floor was a nightclub and it had a gorgeous view right off the strip i mean the doors opened up and it was a great show i mean we packed the place we we i cooked sauce every week yeah i think we had it we had a little uh, moment on youtube up oh, there's the car there it is yeah. Let's see. Can Din you see him? Dinner with a mob. Dinner with a mob. That we called it. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a Facebook page. It's called the Mob Dinner Club. Yeah. Oh, and we man. had fun. We had fun with it because you know people would come there. Yeah. Sal then even had, signed it. <laughs> then we would open it up to questions. Oh my God, the questions we got. Never It'd sit up there. I'd sit there and answer the questions, and yeah. it was it was hilarious. It was funny. Yeah, it was. I think one of the best nights we had was when. Sal put up a, we had a picture of all the characters from Goodfellas mm -hmm. and he did the, you know, he put up the De Niro and then the picture of Jimmy Burke and then tell a story about the real Jimmy and, yeah. and, and Tommy. And it was good because people knew the characters and then he was right. able to really elaborate on who they were and other stories about them and stuff. So yeah, That's people, funny. they really dug that one. And we had other ideas. We wanted to do a thing in, in the, the mob museum and they have a courtroom in there. It's literally a courtroom, and we were going to do a show in there, in the courtroom, about, you know, different trials that were fixed and other, you know, it's just, but they just, you know, they it's a great place. I'm not going to down there. I just don't think they understood Sal enough. Like, no. they want everybody to ship for free, and it's like, you know what, it's a business, and uh, it's, yeah. it depends on what, Sal will do stuff for free, no problem with that, but if you're going to make money off of me, then you got to give me a piece, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's, it's all right. It's fair. I mean, if you want to come on a show like this and there's no money involved, hey, we'll do it all day long. But hey, if I'm gonna, if you're selling tickets and making money off of my name, right? So. Yeah, and then they, I know, yeah, because then it gets to be tricky, and you know they're going to be making money, and then you don't. So yeah, I could see yeah. why. And it was fun walking through the mob museum. Like I said, he could have been like a tour guide there because everybody <laughs> you walk by on the wall, it's like I know this guy. I did this with him. I know this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and, look and, at. And, and, and now Bubbles is talking to, I call her Fat Lisa, because she oh. is fat. Lisa is Henry Hill's former wife, girlfriend, who yeah. took care of him for years. And she saw our show and she called me. Yeah. You talked to her. Yeah. So I said, Bubbles, get with Lisa. You know, get a few thousand dollars from a few people. Before you know it, we'll go to Vegas and rent, rent a small venue. And yeah. we'll produce this play. And she is on fire for it. She loves yeah. it. So I'll leave it to these guys. I don't want any money. I just want to see it happen. Yeah, she's really cool. I sat with her. Sal used to do a one-man show before Vegas. What was that, about 13, 14 years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 he did years. A show, and it was great. He would just get up and, you know, it was kind of like a play. It was like a stand-up comedian, but instead of comedy, he was telling his stories. And uh, we were in a very famous restaurant in L.A. where Robert Blake was supposedly had killed his wife or something. I, I can't remember the name of the place. Vitello's. Vitello's <laughs> Restaurant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was a great little venue. And I sat with Lisa and she's like, I'm, I'm Henry's wife, you know? And it's like, holy shit, you know? You know, there was a story I forgot to tell you guys with Henry. So knew Henry back in the day, not much. Met him a couple of times, you know, back in the day with Sal. And then I had moved to Seattle and I used to listen to Howard Stern show and Henry used to be on all the time. 
Right. And he was like a total drunk drug addict at the time. <laughs> and, uh, he, he was on one day and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm living up in Washington now in this town of Redmond. And I live in the town next to Redmond. Right, you know? right. And he worked in a kitchen at a Mexican restaurant. That's that's where Henry had gotten to it. All his crime and money and Lufthansa. He's working in a restaurant in the kitchen of this little. So I went to the I went to the restaurant and I knocked on the kitchen door and he came out. And I'm like, Henry, I don't know if you remember. He didn't remember his name, but you know, I started dropping names. He's like, holy shit, that's you know, a whole lifetime ago. But he was a fucking disaster at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and he got in trouble. He was selling drugs. Yeah. And Ed McDonald, the prosecutor who was in Goodfellas. Had to go out there and save his ass. So oh. now we're going to have Ed McDonald on our show in October. Ed McDonald's yeah. great. Yeah. He's he's be really he was in Sal's movie. Yeah. Yep, exactly. If you get me through this, I'm going to put you in my movie one day. And he did. <laughs> I'll, I'll make you a Catholic Irish priest. <laughs> <laughs> a gambling, a gambling priest. <laughs> he, he thought I was joking because I met him in 86 or 87. And here it was in 2010. Oh, 20 some years, years later, I called him. I'm sending you a ticket. You'll come to L.A. You'll stay in a nice hotel. You'll come on the set. You'll meet Michael Nori and Danny Nucci and Joey. Uh, Joey Diaz was in the movie, too. Yep. Yep. Look, I got the. We had fun. Oh, yeah, there's the ticket. There's the ticket right here. Sal, when we met up, he had yeah. given me all these ones. Yeah. That, show, that show I did was at the San Francisco Playhouse. Yep. Small little theater. I did it for a couple of weeks. I had a lot of fun there. You know, I was breaking into, you know, I had people call me and they said, did you see Chaz Paul Materi's one-man show, Bronx Tale? You could do the same thing and you were really in the mob. Yeah. You know, what's his name? Paul Materi did like a take, a fictional take on a character. Right. But he, he wrote a good story and everybody loved it. And De Niro produced a movie with him, so. Yeah, I got, I also got these cards the too. Cards. Yeah, the. <laughs> The Sinatra Club, these cards Blank were cards, played with. Cards, yeah. yeah, these ones are actually in the video description, too. If I never got to the Sinatra Club. You, would you call it like 73? Uh, 74. Yeah, so right about the time I met you is when you had the Sinatra Club. Yeah, yeah. But then you had another place right over on Atlantic. I remember my first car I ever got was a 71 Firebird. Wow. I bought it from like this 70-year-old lady. It had cub caps on it. And I drove to the house, you know, I was, had my license I could drive there. And he's like, come with me. And he takes me to this warehouse and pulls out Trans Am wheels that he had. This four, oh, like yeah. Trans Am, the, the big, uh, the waffle cone, uh, whatever the hell. He wore off the Trans Am car. Yeah, take these. And he just, get, you know, I don't know, probably 500 bucks a piece. He just, honeycomb. Honeycomb wheels. Honeycomb. That's, yeah, honeycomb. Yeah, he gave me freaking four wheels for my car off the Trans Am. It, he probably stole and had pieces of it back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he had so much of that stuff, I used to give it away. Yeah, I, I didn't care about selling it, you know. Damn. Yeah. So Joey Bubbles went and got some tires from you. Got some wheels. Went from the old old lady car that was styling right after that. <laughs> All you had to do was just drive by Sal. Go by Sal. You never knew what you were gonna get. <laughs> yeah. Was, I, I, when we, you know, we were talking about that. I, I try to think of things because if I come back, in, but we were doing that go kart race. Remember, I told you the one, the Big Spirit of '76. So Sal did this amazing job of promoting this race for racing. But then the, the mob guy had to come out, right? <laughs> so he wound up renting the entire floor of a Holiday Inn out in Riverhead, Long Island. Literally rented the whole floor. <laughs> One of the rooms he set up, we called it a Calcutta. It's like a sports book to bet on the races and stuff. So now he brought gambling into this race. So we got the race going on, the money to win the race. But then Sal had another whole thing set up where all the drivers could bet on who's going to win and whatever. And then the nighttime. He wanted to have girls for these guys if they wanted women. So we're at, I, yeah. okay, I'm 16 years old, right? You know, if the wind blows good, I'm excited. He goes, come on, we got to go interview some workers for the race. I'm like, okay. And we go down to this little place called the Triangle Bar. It was in, in West Hampton. Uh, and we got in, there's, there's two hookers. I mean, and it looked like they just came off the street corner. Like they didn't try to dress down, you know. And I'm like, you know, 16, my eyes are this big. And we sit at the table and... So I was like, hey, ladies, how you doing? This is what we're doing. He starts telling them there's rich guys you could charge in this, and the poor guys, I'll let you know. you. And he starts, you know, like, you need to fucking suck and do this. And I'm 16. Just hearing a guy say that to a girl, that's <laughs> like, I, I must have been pale white because the girls kept looking at me like, is it okay that this young guy sitting here while we're talking about all this shit? <laughs> and we had gambling, we had prostitution, we had it all set up. 
on top of this perfect race that was going on. See, that was another one I what popped in my head recently. <laughs> so Sal was giving out benefits to the the benefits. The, yeah, a lot of benefits in those days. Yeah, <laughs> I found yeah. the program. I have the program from that. I'll have to send you a picture. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any other pictures of Sal that you've had in Sentinel? I had that one I sent you. That was from that race. Um, that, that ninth, that, that all that went down. Yeah, and then I have one just so that it's from the program. But I don't. Have, somebody had a picture, Sal. I can't remember. It might have been Joey, but it was me and Joey and your first wife out at the West Hampton track, sitting in front of the van. Like I was probably fourteen or fifteen. We were young, maybe even younger. But that was like the only pictures we have. You know, you didn't have cell phones and shit back then. So unless no. you were take pictures you aren't doing it no and then, the camera. Yeah. And then most of their stuff you know went away when they went in everything was gone so they didn't get to take anything no hell no <laughs> <laughs> well uh let's see if anybody has any questions please comment them in but uh we're gonna go and start answering more unless you got anything else you want to throw at us joey no i'm good man that's my uh, visit do your show <laughs> I'll hang out and watch you we'll, guys. we'll get you on every other week and see if you can yeah man it. cool if i don't try to think of stuff i'll try to remember stuff but let's uh Let's see, if, you know, people out there, see what you think about this one-man show thing. You gotta give us your opinion on that, because that'll help us to make a decision if we want to roll with Mafia, it. Mafia, Mafia Row. Mafia, Mafia Row. Row. That's the name of it. Perfect. Right. Have a great day. You too, Joey. Thanks for coming on, man. All right, man. Bye-bye. Later, Bubbles. <laughs> there he goes. I don't know. That well, leads... You know, he, he, you know, like seven, eight years ago, he was still in his 50s. He became a producer, and he's produced some movies with some guys, and his, his wife is a hairdresser. You know, in the business, she does makeup. So he, he loves the stories, and they're good. And it's a different take for us to do like a stage play. Yes, it probably could become a movie, but a stage play could be done anywhere in the world. You That's know, true. Six or eight, ten actors, very few props. You don't need a lot of money to do it. And it, it is a piece of history. So I'd love to leave that here when I check out. <laughs> get a few. You had to get a good project out before you check out. So let's have. Yeah. yeah. Let, let, let us know what you think. Comment. Let, uh, you know, just I don't know. I mean, I think I think it'd be really interesting. I mean, we've been talking about it back and forth for a while. So yeah. I mean, it's not so far fetched, really. Right. Uh, my brother said, "Saul, uh, what was your favorite card game, and which were you best at?" I'm sorry, I couldn't meet you the other day. I was working. Missed a well, good time. I really liked Pinochle. Because you played it with partners. I like that. Yeah, you know, poker was fun. You could get crazy and bluff people. And I did play with Gotti and a whole bunch of other guys. But I like Pinochle because it was a thinking man's game. And the guy I admired most was Jimmy Burke. He was a master card player. So anybody who played Pinochle with Jimmy Burke, oh, my gosh. He could tell you what was left in the last few cards as you were playing the game. He's a brilliant guy. Had a great memory. I learned a lot from Jimmy Burke. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, he, he, he told me in prison that, you know, he would get at, um, you know, get upset with Tommy. He's like, you're not paying attention, right. you know, and shit because of the cards. Because, like, he would know when they were coming, like you said. Um, <laughs> this one's a funny question. From Florida Attorney. Hey, Sal, do you smoke weed? <laughs> that, that's absolutely one thing I didn't do. And if you remember Scarface, the movie, I think Pacino said to maybe Michelle Pfeiffer, oh, you're getting high on your own supply. I never did any drugs, never smoked weed, didn't like the smell of it. And now we walk around in Las Vegas and we smell it all day long. So, you know, it's just the way it is. No, I didn't smoke weed. Did not. You never did in your whole life? Never once. I never smoked a cigarette or weed. I may believe I had a cigar I was puffing on, but no weed, no. <laughs> Damn. Well, we got one from a guy named Foxy. He said, what was your nickname, Sally Sideburns? No, well, it was. Sally Bots, <laughs> which meant crazy Sal, yeah. Yeah, in those days, that, that was my FBI picture with those sideburns. And also, it was about 212 pounds then. So, yeah, it's yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, that's true. Uh, let's see. Lee said it was uh, the chin. He was following up on that Frank uh, the Chico thing. Oh, it was said, the chin. Okay. And he was uh, getting a business card or something. Really? 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sly says, uh, good morning, guys. How you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Good morning, Sly. <clears throat> Um, I think you might have watched this. Uh, Fat Dave said, have you watched the the podcast table with Sammy the Bull and Anthony Ruggiano? You said you watched a little bit, didn't I you? I watched a few minutes of it, and I thought it was cool because maybe the only valid thing that impressed me was that Sammy, you know, saw through who John Gotti became. And, you know, he was breaking all the rules that, the rules that we grew up in. And I guess, I don't know, I heard things that, Sammy probably listened to a recording, maybe that they captured the feds and made him understand that maybe Gotti was going to kill him. And then Gotti didn't care about, you know, Angelo. So Gotti's focus changed and his principles, you know, were compromised by his greed. And I'm sure it was the ego. When I look at Donald Trump today, I think I see a little piece of John Gotti. Yeah, no, I mean, just the ego ego is what you're talking about, egotistical kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this one says, did, what did you know about Virginia Hill? I didn't know a thing about her, only what I saw in the movies, you know, and I thought, I thought that that was a good movie, Bugsy. I thought that was really well done. I thought so, too. Yeah, I thought those two actors were great. Um, this next one is from Mike. He said, uh, salute from Lu Louisiana. And he asked, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know any Cortinas? What is that? No, about? no, I never knew much about, about that place. Uh, I mean, I know that Louisiana is a sort of a different world because they have, you know, the touch of the French justice system and all that kind of stuff. But there was a lot that went on there. And I always do a little research back. You know, like with the Kennedy assassination. So it always fascinated me how things went through Louisiana. No, that's true. Uh, looks like we got a super chat here. I don't see a question on here with it, but um, if you want to send a, a question, uh, how do you say that name, Sal? What is it? Dunstan Munson. Dunstan Munson. Yeah, if you, if you got a question you want to ask Sal, go ahead, but we appreciate that. The, yeah. Send it in a super chat. If anyone else wants to send in any, uh, you know, Sal, I don't know if you want to give another one of these way if anyone sends any super chats. Yeah, out. send them a card. They'll like it. They'll have a little piece of uh, history. Yeah, this is pretty much all the mafia memorabilia that Sal has from that life. It's these cards that were played with in the Sinatra Club by a lot of high-ranking mobsters. So if you send in a super chat and you email me your address, we'll send them out to you. Let me drop it right now i'll drop my email in the video description uh i'll let you answer this question sal while i'm doing that i didn't know much about the new jersey guys i gotta tell you back in brooklyn new york you know we always looked at anybody from new jersey that's why i didn't think that the sopranos was impressive to me but we used to call the guys from new jersey ah oh, it's a bunch of farmers over there they try to be gangsters but now, I didn't know much about much about John DeGilio. I did meet a bunch of guys from Elizabeth, New Jersey, while I was in prison. There were some tough guys out of there also. But, uh, you know, I just didn't know anybody much from Bayonne. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There was, uh, nah, I don't know. We probably might not get into this one. Just drama. I think another guy made a video about you. And he uh, just, you know, saying that you're fake or whatever, but we won't even get into it. That's what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of uh, New Jersey Bob Mendez getting indicted for bribery on Friday? Congress right. And this, the new this mafia. is brand new. This is brand new, an indictment. Him and his wife, and they took gold. I've already read about it. They took gold and they took, you know, money and, Listen, I mean, there's always corruption. This guy's a U.S. senator. I'm, like, surprised that he risked his, you know, professional life and his character. But, you know, guys are going to do that kind of stuff. They think some politician thinks they're entitled to take money from, from the public. Uh, we'll see what happens with that case. He was acquitted on a previous case years ago. So if you follow it, we'll talk about it. It'd be great for someone to follow the case you know, in detail so we could kick it around. Uh, let's see. Yeah, no, that would be good. 
good idea to do some current events, like you said. Uh, Joey Bubbles' <laughs> wife said, great show. CC, yeah. Oh, we should talk a little bit about this. Uh, he said, Sal, did Ed McDonald represent Joe Messina? Yes, and I didn't really know much about it till uh, the end because McDonald was a very interesting character. He was very careful about what he spoke about, and he was assigned Messino after he flipped. And I think two days ago, Messino checked out and died. So I had talked to McDonald last week, about a week or so ago, and he's in Europe. And when he comes back sometime the first, second week of uh, October, we're going to have him on. So it should be fun, and we're going to learn a lot that went on, you know, sort of secretly around New York, you know, the Eastern District in Brooklyn and the Southern District of Manhattan, and how he worked with Giuliani. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, yes, he did represent Messino. And if you read about Messino, he had to surrender like $7 million in gold when he flipped. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, he had to pay his debt to the, the feds, I guess you could say. Yeah. I yeah. will tell you, just last week or 10 days ago, I went through Vegas and I stopped in this little town of Boulder City. And there was a guy from the same neighborhood as Messino. And he used to go to J&J &J Deli or J&J, &J, uh, you know, it was like catering. And that's what Messino owned. And we talked about the neighborhood. And the guy just shaking his head. Wow, did things change, he said. And then I gave him a, a card. And he said, I'm going to listen to your podcast. I don't know if he's listening, but he was a nice guy from back in Maspic. Damn, that's cool. Like, I didn't even know you did that. that that's awesome, man. Yeah. I think um, the whole Joe... Messino thing. I mean, recently he just died, and I guess Joey uh, Merlino was the first one to announce that. You know, he just started his podcast, right? And, uh, right. You know the. You know, so I, I don't. Uh, I don't know how he got the information first or whatever, but for whatever reason, he knew, yeah. and everybody started making videos and stuff about it. So yeah, Gary Jenkins reached out to me the other day, and he told me to you know get at with you and see about doing a show with him on Joe right. Messino because yeah, you Gary, did. You, Gary is a can former Kansas City police officer who I did an interview with a long time ago. And then he introduced me to Adrian. And I said, ah, I don't want to do any interviews. And then we started <laughs> doing them. And he said, there's a lot of people that want to hear this stuff. So that's how we kind of met. No, that, yeah, that is exactly how we met. And we just kept going, running with it. So, I mean, fuck, I guess we're four months in now. I, that's what I was looking. We got 15 episodes. That's one a week. That's got to be four months now, maybe three yeah. or four months. Yeah. So we've been getting at it. That's for damn sure. Uh, let's see. Dirty said, did you play spades? <laughs> no, nah, not too much spades. I played an Italian uh, card game called uh, Brisk, Brisk. And we played Pinochle. We played Gin Rummy, of course, poker. We played poker in the 70s before anybody was popular with, you know, with the poker they play today, you know. So yeah. we did play that that stuff way back. Well, we got uh, another super chat here from, uh, say his name again. This is uh, Computron. Yeah, yeah. He yeah said, I was in jail with Chicken Phil Testa in Lewisburg and Harry the Hump Rigabini. And I thought those guys were like absolute amazing. They were already older than I was. And I actually met the Chicken Phil Testa's son, Salvi, his name was Sal, in the oh, yeah. visiting room. And by the time I get out in 75, I think, you know, Chicken Phil Testa's son has started to, you know, make a move up upper echelon in Philadelphia. And I think that that crazy, uh, crazy guy killed him. What was his name? Uh, uh, Nicky Scarfo. Scarfo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't pay a lot of attention to the Philly guys, but I did meet a bunch of guys from philadelphia while i was in uh, lewisburg yeah well, well good question on that we appreciate the super chat if anyone else wants to send any in we're, we're gonna continue to go on to some other people that their questions haven't been heard yet because we do have a few on here so if i mean let's see um so denise commented in Denise. Sal played with all the ladies, she said. <laughs> no, stop that, Denise. I met you for 48 years ago. <laughs> but Denise is uh, a writer in Detroit, and she's been following the corruption up there. And she's trying to help a guy who was wrongly convicted of murder. So uh, we should send her email because you never know who's out there listening. 
and she's trying to help this guy, you know, get get exonerated from the complete charge. So I appreciate our friendship. Denise talks to me and my wife, and you know, it's just a fun friendship for 45, 48 years. No, uh, I mean that's true. So I mean, if anybody wants to follow her, her Instagram is on. It's spelled her name is spelled the same way that it's on here. So you can check her out on there and go follow her and yeah. see what she's up to. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, let's see. Matt says your stories are the best on YouTube. Such detail. Did you know Anthony? Oh yeah. What's the last name on there? Anthony Stabil. Who was that? Well, he was a big heavy set guy who was really funny. I knew him and his wife Anita. Um, I thought he. I didn't think he was with the Gambinos, but maybe he was. I thought he was more with, with the Bananos. I'm not sure though. We didn't talk about that stuff back then. But uh, yeah, Tony Stabil, and he had pretty daughters. He had a brother that was, um, yeah. Actually, Anthony was Fat Tommy's brother. Let me get that straight. Hadn't thought much about those guys in 45 years. but And they were connected. I'm not sure where Anthony was. I believe he was killed. But they were connected to both families somehow. But Fat Tommy was the brother. That's right. And so, they only lived, lived a few blocks from where we lived. So Fat Tommy, is that Anthony's nickname? No, that was Fat Tommy was Fat Tommy Stabile. And Anthony oh. was his brother. And oh. I believe Anthony hung out maybe with Charles Coniglia. I'm not sure. I sort of left the scene in the early 80s. But I knew about Anthony. But Fat Tommy and his wife, Anita, and the girls, I knew them. They were coming to my Italian deli. That's true. Okay. Well, well maybe we'll have to do some research on him, see who he was. Because, I mean, if he was a uh... – I think, you know, doing stories on guys that weren't really heard of will, right. will stand out and you doing your talking about your in, in, encounters with them will be right. interesting because people will like that to hear yeah. about different shit. Um, let's see. Good question, though, man. Thank you. Uh, let's see. This one is from Jay. Said, what was your impression of Gary Papa? What was he like? Jerry Papa, I think, was the guy that Cataldo killed. I'm not sure. Yeah, I yeah. just didn't that, know him. I, I think didn't know so. Jerry. I didn't know Jerry Papa. I did not know him. That's right. That's why that name's familiar because, yeah, that was the one that Sammy had told about. Right. But he was no relation to Vincent Papa. I don't believe he was. None. Oh, okay. Same name. I, I, I don't think so. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's, uh, let's see. We got another one here. Good morning, guys. When there were two women living upstairs in the Sinatra Club, was that real? And the guy who was got whacked for sexually molesting the little girl was a story I heard about in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Okay, well, you know, we took a little creative license, and I put the two girls up in the uh, in the in the, in the apartment above the club. But you know, it was down the block that they were. And one of the girls that played a hooker in there was a wonderful girl named Brooke Lewis. She managed to produce the movie Sinatra Club and got a lot of the guys that were in Goodfellas and Sopranos. She got those guys together and she helped raise money. But uh, the story about the guy who was, you know, who sexually molested a little girl, there was an actual guy that did that. But I sort of blended the story together in a creative way and, Kind of let the public know we wouldn't stand for some guy, you know, molesting a young girl. I mean, this is something, you know, I didn't believe in. That wasn't exactly, I had no interest in that. Yeah, no, that's a good question, Jacqueline. Thanks for typing that in. Uh, Denise said that there was, the, this is who she was talking about. Right, Jerome. Yeah, you guys look it up, Kowalski. See if you can help Denise somewhere, somewhat. It's amazing how people know things out there. And uh, good information, accurate information is well appreciated. So Denise has followed that case for years. She's helped the guy get out. I think he's out now living with his son. And I think he was purely 100% framed. So I hope she can help get this guy completely exonerated from the charge. She said they knew the real killer. How about that? <laughs> that's interesting yeah sometimes it's not too uh 
you know, someone close is what it seems like to the relationship of the person or, you know, you just never know who it's going to be. It might not be a random person when you're thinking about it. It's maybe someone close. Uh, let's see. This one from Jay, he said, Sal, did you know Tony Mira? Tony Mira. No, I didn't know him. Cataldo was friends with him, though, and I heard him talk about I believe he got whacked. I'm not sure, but I think there was Tony Mira and maybe a brother. But I didn't know those guys. Look at Jay. He he knows something. How would, no, no. How would Jay know about this stuff? It's amazing. Comment in, Jay. How do you know? He's probably just a researcher, man, or he grew up in the area. Yeah. That's what a lot of them you know, usually are. But, uh, no, I mean, we're almost at that 90-minute mark. I mean, do you uh, have any other things you want to bring up before we wrap up, Sal? No, but I like the people that have interest. And sometimes a guy like Jay, a little tiny detail of, of a character opens up a whole whole door. One time I read that the FBI likes to watch and listen to podcasts. They they somehow think that you know they could actually go after certain criminals who are bragging about crime. I mean I don't brag about it. I tell it like it is. You know the stuff I did so long ago. Oh my God! I went to Texas in 1985. Never saw a criminal. Never saw a drug. Never saw a gun. And I found legal ways to make money. And that's what I like to tell people. You can get creative, especially there's a lot of thieves that are creative. Well, take that creativity and turn it into dollars. And that's that's what I did. So Yeah. No, I mean, there is current guys or guys that got out of the life that weren't, you know, cooperating witnesses. So I guarantee you the feds are going to like be all over their show. Right. I mean, yeah, they can hear from the, you know, the guys that co cooperate with the government as well. But... I think they're going to be more likely to listen to, you know, ones that didn't, you know, because these guys have to be very careful because they were never convicted on anything like that. Right. Exactly. But, you know, well, you know, like you, like you said, there's there's certain stories and stuff that you can talk about and then the ones that you can. not But uh, I'm going to see. Uh, let, let's see. Jacqueline was having trouble. She said she said she was trying to send a super chat, but she was having troubles with it. I was going to help her. Um <clears throat> So, Jacqueline, when you do it, you go to the live chat, you click the bottom right, and there's a money, like a little dollar logo. And then you can either click super stickers or super chat. And then you just, uh, you can type in a question or yeah, you can just, you can type in a question and then hit go to purchase and then it should work. I see she's a loyal follower. Yeah. Adrian's <laughs> got some cards. If she didn't get a card, we should send her one. Yeah, and Jacqueline, if, like I said, if you want to email me, I'll put the email in the live chat, and you can email me your address, right. and then we'll send you one. Send her a souvenir. We got lots of those. I yeah, know. You got all kinds of shit. I got to put the Dinner with the Mobster card on the website, and then right. this this one right here, the Sinatra Club movie ticket. Yeah. Here's sound uh, sound. Signed by Sal. And then, I, I did that at the San Francisco Playhouse. Yeah. That one. I don't have many of those left. We sold out. I kept maybe a couple of dozen cards. Uh, oh, shit. Tick, that's actually a ticket to a show. Yeah, yeah that, no. It's, it even has the date, twenty uh, $28, and then the 8 p.m. time on it. <laughs> right, that's what right. it says on it. Uh, let's see. There's a few other questions that came in, but let's see if... Uh, This one says, "Do you did you ever know John Rick Riccobono?" I I didn't know him. He ran a Salvation Club in, in Manhattan. Interesting. Wow. What about Henry Borelli? I oh from the Gemini guys. I didn't know him, but he hung out with uh, with the two boys, those Gemini killers. Oh, and, Anthony. Uh, Roy, Roy DeMeo. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question, but yeah, I guess you didn't know him. No. Uh, this one says, Sal, Mikey Scar said that Pauly Sack predicted John would be the boss. Did John have any boss-like qualities? What stood out for John? Absolutely. John had this charisma, and he was like a Pied Piper. People like to follow him around. He was well-spoken. He was smart. It was people who said he wasn't smart, but for the street, he was very street smart. And he did have leadership qualities. He could plug people in. And I truly believe that John was like 
Caesar back then, you know, divide and conquer. Like he had people all over the city and he would make people do things that he wanted them to do. And I don't think too many people, even his own brothers, knew everything that God he was doing. No. So I, I thought he was uh, clever and I thought he had good qualities. He also had this other part of his personality where if he stubbed his toe or his finger, he would never admit anything, not admit anything. And that's what I saw in the personality of Donald Trump. He don't want to admit anything. He never want to admit he was wrong. And that was God. He would never admit anything. And I think, you know, he wanted people to follow him unconditionally. Yeah, and I think that he he was good with it cause like that because, I mean, you saw it, but you recognized it for what it was, but you just right. like, ah, you know, let's just get away from him because this is not going in the direction that I'm trying to be. Right, exactly. Uh, Denise said, Adrian is a very good host. Thank you, Denise. Well, thank you. <laughs> let's see. Uh, he's Dust, how do you say it? D Dunstan? He said, hello, super chat form. Me, no question. I appreciate what you do. I didn't not know I would receive a playing card. Thank you. Oh, he, he had sent one earlier, a super Ooh. chat. Yeah, yeah, just send us your uh, your email. Yeah, yeah, your, uh, send an email to the one that I dropped in the live chat, and, uh, you know, we can get that out. You know, for people that send live chats, you know what I mean? It's, you know, these super chats, they're nice, and they help out, Fun. and especially with what we're trying to do. I mean, you know, we'll have to start maybe some some kind of page for that uh, right. the project you're trying to get out there. Oh, the Mafia Row. The Mafia, Mafia Row. That's a piece of history, and I think everybody would like it. Uh, I could see the whole curtain going back and Paulie character cutting the garlic, and everybody <laughs> would know what it's about. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. Um, let's see. You didn't know uh, Little Nicky or any of them. No, I, di I didn't associate with the uh, Philly guys. No. You know, you were so centrally located. I mean, if you were in Queens, you were in Queens. Basically, the mob families kept everybody separated. So you, you couldn't uh, associate. You could if you knew them, but it wasn't something that, you know, we had an ambition to do, associate with guys in other cities. Yeah. Well, I'm going to answer these last two. And then after that, that should be good. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to stop, you know, like but as soon as they, they start, you know, then they get more comes in. Um, this one's a good one. It says, do you miss the lifestyle? You know, I did the Sinatra movie and at the end I was walking around doing a voiceover. I didn't miss the life, but the guys that were like friendly, you really had, you know, very concentrated, loyal friends. So I did say I missed the friendships, you know, because it took years to develop that. No, I didn't miss the life because it turned sour. Guys were killing over money, and that bothered me. So I don't miss the life. And when I got to Hollywood, it was similar in a different way. You know, Hollywood was very egotistical, very selfish. Yeah. And, and it was hard to make progress in Hollywood. Of course, I was an older guy getting there at, you know, at 50 years old, you know, 45, 50. But I had fun in Hollywood. I worked there with several different names. So people didn't know who I was. My credits didn't always, you know, show up on IMDb. But yeah, I enjoy yeah. I enjoyed meeting all the actors. I met a lot of great actors, producers. So you had fun after the last. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for the question, TBP. <laughs> the next one and the last one will ah shit. Okay, they they just had basically a follow up. They said uh, thank you, Sal. I got your book and I like the movie as well. Well, the movie, I like the book a lot. The movie, because we only had so much money, and I didn't really understand how I had this 120-page script, how we could turn it into a movie. But by the time I hired the director, we had to cut 20 or 30 pages out. So the, <laughs> the content of the movie changed. It was okay. We got it completed. We had fun. And just to go to Hollywood and get a movie made is such an accomplishment, really. Yeah, it really is. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. And they had a follow-up. They said, because of your book, I got into Frank Sinatra's uh, music, music as well. <laughs> um, let's see. Very cool. So you, these are just, just t these guys are just tuning out. They said, I'm in Vegas. Uh, let's see, for the Raiders and Steelers game. 
but I made sure to tune in, Sal. Let's go Raiders just to win, maybe. <laughs> I, I like think. the I like the Raiders. We we live about a hundred miles away from Vegas. We get there all the time because my wife has two sons that work for Tesla. And I like the Raiders. They just need to win. You know, I think they got a good coach now, and I think they got some good players. So let's hope they can turn it around and start winning. They got talent. They got good receivers. So I'll be watching them. Thanks for tuning in, especially if you're out there going to watch the game. And then this is a it says great show, guys. Lee from Utah. Thanks for tuning in, Lee. So that, that's that's uh, that was a good good. You know, we're still uh, getting videos out there every week, and you know, we'll just end on you know if you want to get mine and Sal's. Uh, or like our Patreon show, we have exclusive videos over there. We offer about stories that we continue on from our podcast that really can't be on YouTube because YouTube could might take them down or, you know, they're just exclusive for our Patreon subscribers. So, I mean, that's what we really do over there. We offer, you know, our community. Sal has little side stories and stuff we write about on there as well, too. So, you know, if you want to go check us out over there, you can. Also, like I said, I got the in the video description the Sinatra Club playing cards. If you guys want to buy them, and uh, his books in there as well, Sinatra Club book. If you want to get them all autographed, but yeah, um, you can after this episode as well. You can watch if you haven't caught it yet. We dropped our video of uh, Tony Roach, and then next week will be Peter Sicaro on Saturday. So after this video, if you're interested, I'll be posting. Rick Perello, the Cleveland Mafia. His family was involved with the Mafia in Cleveland. Cool. So I'll be that, that'll be for my show as well. So you got anything else you want to promote or say, Sal, before we No, end? it's good. I enjoy Sunday. Sunday's a good day, and we'd like to get it done before football starts. So that works out about this time. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just end on that. Thanks for tuning in.